go back to his text and, and read, oh, he's talking about the market, he's talking about this, the state. But strictly speaking, let me put it this way, if we're going to be strict delusions, if we're going to carry delusion ontology to its ultimate consequences logically, we have to exclude any reified generality. There's no such thing as evil in general. There's only specific cruelty. The cruelty of Hitler, the cruelty of, of, uh, of uh, you know, the Mongols, for instance, or, Attila, or the Huns, Attila the Hun, or the cruelty of many dictators. Then that real cruelty, which is suffered by people when those dictators exterminate entire communities or ethnic cleanse an entire region, is reified into evil in general, and then we're introducing an entity that doesn't really exist and that shouldn't really be part of our explanations. But then, but there's belief in evil, right? Is that part of the ontology that then affects behavior, maybe? Yeah, so in my ontology, belief in evil would be a real entity, right? I mean, it obviously, as I said yesterday, beliefs are powerful, yeah. even if they are about non-existent entities. So believing seventy virgins in heaven as a reward for martyrdom, despite the fact that ontologically speaking there are no seventy virgins in heaven waiting for these guys, nevertheless the concept, the proposition, the, the meaning of that sentence is a very real entity, and a, an, a, an attitude of belief towards that entity is also very real, particularly if your devotion or the intensity of the belief is very, very high. And then the effect, that intensity, and that proposition has on your behavior is also very real. In fact, what could be more real than blowing yourself up, right? in terms of, you know, and then we, and, and we would certainly have to use it as part of the explanation, why did that particular human bomb explode himself? Well, there's, or rather, let me put it this way, why are the, all those pieces and arms all over the place? Well, part of the explanation is going to be causal, because he exploded, and the explosives broke his body in a bunch of parts. But another part, and another part is going to be reasons, because in his community and in the, the, the church he belongs to, they have these particular beliefs. And then part of it is probably going to be a motive, a personal motive. He himself wanted to be a martyr for these particular reasons. So there's going to be all three parts of the, all three components of an explanation, to, to explain why there's all these limbs and, 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 and pieces of head all over the place where this guy exploded there. So yes, beliefs about evil are certainly part of explanation. Evil itself shouldn't be. In other words, we shouldn't really be talking about here why did Hitler uh, uh, almost won World War II because of evil. That would not be a good, uh, that would not be an answer to the why question. You were mentioning before uh, the, the singularity or the single individual or entity. Could we call them units uh, from the whole? Or I mean, I don't know if we want to go into measuring, but you mentioned that some cities could be more singular than others. So I, I, I wish you could yeah, explain that. Yeah. How does that actually work? Exactly. Yeah. All cities are singular ontologically, right? In the sense that each one has its own history. It doesn't matter how boring the history, and each one has its own buildings and its own a, 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 a plaza and, and, and so on, in, in some of them it's just very standardized and just a copy of, of what you know everybody does. Some others, brilliant architects managed to create something. And so all of them are singular ontologically, but and may, perhaps I did not talk correctly, some of them express that singularity better than others. But is that because... Uh Let's say singular entities around the world recognize that. Are you talking about the kind of the knowledge that somebody has of events or things like that? Is there singularity? Well, it could also it could be because of the very peculiar and singular events that have happened in that city, and the and, and you know cities with plenty of artists like Florence <laughs> tend to express their singularity more precisely because they you know they. Lots of artists migrate to that city. They create expressions of, 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 of Tuscany. And, and, you know, they love Tuscany. They write in Tuscan, like Dante, Boccaccio, and Petrarca. So novel, a, a kind of a literary tradition starts in Florence. Painting styles that are unique to start in Florence. Then you compare Florence 
to say some small town in other parts of Italy that does, that never have artists and so on. That other little city will still be singular, but in its history has not had enough practices, both artistic, political, economic, and so on, to express that singularity and to kind of become even more unique, to express that uniqueness. So I, I misspoke before. I should have said, I should have made a distinction between being singular and expressing your singularity, whether with pictorial expressions, literary expressions, political expressions. You may have a, a particular but moment. Expression that, that, has to, that has to affect an area outside, because I mean, I'm sure there are specific expressions of, of grandiose uh, creativity, I don't know, in a small town in Morocco, but uh, if the singularity is less because it hasn't grown out, or the expression hasn't been recognized? Well, I'm not sure, you know, that's a good question actually, you know, it has to do with how much knowledge we have about the history of different cities, maybe some cities seem boring, because we don't have enough uh, history history about them, but once you read their history, you go, wow, you know, it was destroyed in World War II, that's why the building seemed to be kind of 50s standardized construction, and now looks totally non-singular, totally uh, uh, kind of run-of-the-mill and ordinary, but prior to World War II, you, sh you should have seen those buildings, or, you know, prior to World War II, you should have seen the ferment that the intelligentsia and the cultural elite had here, they were, there was a lot more effervescence, and there was a lot more singularity. Then came World War II, you know, a lot of people migrated, like many artists migrated away from New Orleans after Katrina, right? You know, depriving it of some of, of its expression of singularity, which was all the musicians on the street, you know, and, 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 and the people that, that, that worked there. And it's taken a while for all those men to, to migrate back and to, and to give New Orleans its its expression of singularity. But let's, let's leave that for a, aside for a second because that would have to, it's, an, it's a very important question, but just at, at, the, at an ontological level, every city is singular. Just like every nation state is singular, just like every community is singular, just like every institutional organization is singular. Right? All we need to get rid of is reified generalities. That's the most important. We need to replace them with singular individuals at different scales. Now, another thing that is very important is to consider how individual entities at one scale make up wholes at a larger scale. Here perhaps the best example would be individual persons making up a community, and right now you know, there's all kinds of communities, there's old-fashioned communities living in ethnic neighborhoods in cities, you know, like the Little Italy in New York, there used to be an Italian community, or Hell Kitchen, there used to be an Irish community. Uh, today, of course, we have communities in the internet, you know, like in, in my face, MySpace and, 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 and Facebook and so on, where you can also get a certain kind of communities. You can also have dispersed communities, just networks of friends which live in different cities. They don't have to occupy a particular space in town, but that they keep in touch so often and maybe even gather together at different in different places that they do form a kind of community of friends. So there's all kinds of communities. But let's start with the simplest type, which is a small town community, like a tightly knit community. That community is made out of in, in part, persons. It's of course also made out of the houses that exist in that neighborhood, of the streets that, that are made part of that neighborhood, of the pets and other animals that are part of the community. But the most important component of the community as far as the, the, the as far as explanations of what happens to that community or what has happened in history to that community is that it's made out of persons. Now, so in other words, what is very important to get rid of very five generalities is philosophically, is the part to hold relationship. The relationship in which certain component parts come together to form a whole. Now sometimes, for certain wholes, like if I, can I just want to move your thing a little bit? If I, you know,